None of us had ever spent a winter in Vermont. We had no idea what cold really meant. We needed a lot of wood to get through a winter and we didn't have it, or the money. The problem I spoke of earlier between Dave and Mary escalated to a full-scale war and one day Mary took her kids and walked away from the Chimney Rock house. Everyone was really angry and hurt and finally I left to go find her. She had moved into an attic of a lady friend on the other side of town and as the temperature dropped I moved in with her. This created a feud between David and me which was useless and has long since been cried about and laughed about by everyone except for Mary. Dave and I were brothers and that's that, tied together by an umbilical cord and that will last forever. Well, winter in Vermont broke with two kids, a dog, a cat, an angry woman, and a crazy troubadour. It was not much fun. The highest paying bar gig in Vermont was $50 a night. No room, no food. Mary bought an old Jeep and got a job cleaning chalets at Mount Snow Ski Resort. I sang all over the southern half of Vermont and came home to a closed down ski resort that we found to live in with about six other hippies every night. We were all broke and young and dumb. I found out real quick that thin cowboy boots could not be worn outside New England in the winter. I froze my feet several times before I discovered Sorrel boots with wool liners. Dave, Kathleen, and Sunrise Cricket were at the Chimney Rock house. I slipped away every so often to see them. Gypsy Lady wouldn't even talk about them. I got real sick with pneumonia that December and thought I would die. I kept singing anyway and damaged my throat and lungs and finally got well. Life was tough and too serious that winter, but we lived through it. I thought spring would never come. Forty below in January and February, snow up to an elephant's ass. Bar owners were tighter than the bark on a tree, and poverty ate through me like fire through a forest. It was downright sad and miserable. Someday that, sometime that fall and winter, I picked up some new friends in the music world. I also kept the music world in another spot in my soul, and no matter how bad things were at home, the music brought me out of it. Peter Newland, rock and roller. Peter Wilson, just plain folk. Mo Dixon, famous folk star. Willie Maloney, Irish drunk harmonica player. John Roberts, body sea shanty singer. Damaris Barnard, the greatest voice ever to sing. Leon, saxophone player. That's just a few of the great musicians I met in New England. Peter Wilson, my buddy and brother and dream sharer. A skinny kid from North Carolina wandered into the open mic night on Tuesday night in the fall with a beat up Gibson acoustic guitar and wanted to play guitar and sing with me. He had long curly black hair and two whiskers on his chin, maybe four. He constantly laughed and had no equipment at all. I told him if he wanted to pick and sing with me, he would need a microphone and mic stand and a stand for his guitar. We played guitars through microphones back then. No one had pickup mics on acoustic guitars yet, and this was great because guitars still sounded like wooden handmade instruments, a much mellower sound than all this electric crap nowadays. The audiences still listened to musicians and didn't try to out-talk the entertainers. It wasn't until a couple years later that television, cable TV, game machines, cocaine, lower alcoholic beer, sports took over the bar business. That was when folk singers started plugging in just so they could hear themselves. Wilson became my partner and we played, laughed, wrote music, and chased women all over Vermont. Drinking had become a major part of Mountain John by then and Wilson tried to keep me smoking pot. I couldn't keep my timing between me and my audience on pot. That was due to the influence of an audience that increasingly, increasingly moved into cocaine and hard liquor. Their attention span went from 45 minutes to 3 minutes and the show went from long funny stories 
to short, dirty comedy. Dirty comedy and up-tempo music was the only thing that would keep customers in the bar. Everyone was drunk and strung out on cocaine. Pot was the way to come down from the coke and booze. The world became real weird about this time, and paranoia ran through everyone who hung out in the bars. My show became raunchy and crazy, and so did I. But I would not ever stop playing. My life was giving people a smile on their face and a tear in their eye. Wilson's energy kept me centered enough in my acoustic roots to keep me from losing my oaky, slow way of entertaining. His ability to write a lyric and beautiful melody taught me a way of not losing the simple beauty of a slow, pretty ballad. Thank God he came along in those days. I probably would have wound up in the gutter Without him, we kept going through ice and snow and booze and drugs and women and endless miles. Peter Newland and fate brought me another influence. One night in the fall at Brother Newland's kitchen table in Asheville, Mass., Peter asked me to recite the story and poem about Yukon Tim. He said he would never forget that night I walked into the cold rain inn and spellbound his audience. I sat there and did what he wanted, and he stopped me when I mentioned bartender Jimmy Shea's name, and he said, what's Jim's last name? I said, Shea. He said, where is he from? I said, somewhere in Massachusetts. Jimmy, I believe, grew up in Springfield, Mass. Peter Newland had been in a band when he was 14 called The Ragged Edge, and Jimmy Shea had been the rhythm guitar player caddy corner across the United States from Palm Desert to New England I had been sent to a bar where only God could have known that my life would be helped a dozen times over by Peter Newland what a small world we live in